Welcome everyone. We are in a session called How to Embark on Dual or Joint PhD Programs. So as a, as a starting remark, at University of Malaya, we make the impossible possible. That being said, we are opening thousands more doors of possibilities for impeccable talents and academics like yourself to be part of our co-supervision squad in steering the pathways for our soon-to-be dual PhD holders. So this is an exclusive event and invite for you to learn more on how you could partake as the co in our flagship academic programs. Dual PhD programs jointly organized by world-ranked universities. So at University of Malaya, together we are making impact to the world. Let me just um, start by greeting everyone. Assalamualaikum, very good morning, very good, uh, very good day to all of you here today. Welcome to our webinar entitled How to Embark on Dual or Joint PhD Programs. Let me first briefly introduce all the sessions in today's webinar. This is going to be a three-hour session. We start at 10 and we'll end around 1 o'clock. So these three hours will be broken into three parts where or three sessions, whereby the first session is the introduction on dual or joint PhD programs by Prof. Vita and uh, Prof. Norshina. We'll have a short little break in between with a Q&A session before we move on to the session number two, which is charting a successful co-supervision on dual or joint PhD programs. The second session will be moderated by Prof. Dr. Yong Zulina, and we will have Dr. Inli and Dr. Ashril to share their experiences. We will also have a second, uh, a third session starting at 12 on the third hour of the session. So we'll have a little break in between all the three sessions. The third session will be success stories from supervisors of the dual or joint PhD program. So we'll have Dr. Mio to share with us at that time. So we'll end the whole thing around 12.30, 12.45. We'll have an overall Q&A session if, if you have um, questions that are raised from, from the earlier sessions. And we will end roughly around uh, just before 1.00 for our closing remarks and photo session, if there was, there will be no other questions at the time. So, all right. So at the end of the session also, we will have a link, share the link with you in order for us to get your expression of interest for dual or joint PhD programs. So after listening to the webinar for about three hours, we would like to get your uh, feedback or your expression of interest. So um, stay put to the end of the session if you would like to um, express your interest in joining this uh, program. So without further ado, um, before we go any further with today's webinar, some housekeeping announcement for all of, all of us. I would like to request that we kindly mute ourselves while the session is running. And we welcome questions at any time of the session at the chat area. So just click on the chat section and type in your questions there. Um, we will uh, look through it and any of the speakers, if you have um, answers to that question that were raised, you can just type it in, your answers, a short answers. And uh, we will attend to the questions if it's not done yet, or we will take up the questions um, during the Q&A session when we have uh, a dedicated time for that. So the questions are, you, you're more than welcome to just put in your questions in the Q&A session anytime after the webinar. Uh, just type it in, yeah? Um, as I mentioned, we will have a designated Q&A session at of each three sessions. So session one, we'll have a little Q&A session for the speakers. Session two, we'll have a little Q&A session for the speakers. And session three, and then at the end, we have a overall q &A session. So uh, we want this to be um, open and relaxed. You are more than welcome to ask anything at any time. And we, um, we welcome very much all your feedback. Okay. Second point about housekeeping, the session will be recorded by ADEC and will be made available in ADEC official YouTube channel. Uh, so we do have an ADEC official YouTube channel, if you don't know yet, ADEC University of Malaya. Please do not press any recording button on your laptop during the session. So we do not want uh, anyone to interfere with our recording process. So um, just take note of that. Yeah, thank you. 
And the third point is kindly ensure that you have filled in the attendance form and the feedback form before leaving the session. Uh, please note that certificate is only provided to participants who have filled out the feedback form. So we will, we will um, be expecting your attendance form and your feedback form at the end of the session in order for us to provide the certificate. Both links will be provided in the chat area towards the end of the session. All right. So um, without further ado, I would like to um, invite and open the session number one, Introduction on Dual slash joint PhD programs. Our first speaker is Prof. I.R. Dr. Rosita Yusuf, Deputy Director of Academic Strategic Planning Centre. So without further ado, Prof. Rosita, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Noraza. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank you, the edX and also IRO for inviting uh, me to give some briefing on the dual and all joint PhD program. <laughs> Of UN, uh, I'm uh, okay. I'm uh, Ros Rosita from uh, Academic Strategic Planning Center. Like being introduced by Dr. Nor Noraza just now, I think let me share my slide first. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yes, Prof. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the topic of this uh, webinar for now, the first one is actually how to embark on the dual joint. Sorry, Prof. Um, is it only on my side that Prof is... Uh frozen the screen is frozen can i get feedback yes it's frozen on uh, yes, my it's side frozen. okay okay so we'll request prof rosita to uh, restart in a while perhaps without the camera sorry yeah uh, Sorry about that, guys. Uh, we're still trying to get it fixed. Okay, so um, maybe I can request that you have any opinion or burning questions from the beginning that you can start typing your questions here so the speakers can ha start having a look and um, slowly address them during, the, during their talks. So if you have any. So let's see if Prof. Uh, Rosita is ready again. Okay. So to, to those who just joined in, we have started the session and uh, we start with the uh, first session. We will have three sessions, one hour each throughout the, the, the webinar. The first one will be introduction on dual join PhD programs. So that's the first session. Uh, and then the second one will be um, moderated by Prof. Yong Zulina, charting a successful co-supervision on dual joint PhD programs. And we have the speakers to be Dr. Lim In Lee and Dr. Ashril. And then uh, we'll have a quick um, break and Q&A session for that slot. Then we move on to the third session, which is success story from supervisors of the dual joint PhD program. So um, right now, we are expecting to listen from Prof. Uh, Rosita, the Deputy Director of Academic and Strategic Planning Centre ASP of University Malaya. So I can see that um, we have questions that are coming in. That's okay. You just park your questions there. When, when the speakers see them, perhaps we can have um, them to address it along the way or at the end of the session. And after Prof. Rosita, we'll have Prof. Sheena, Professor Dr. Siti Nurshina Muhammad Zain, 
Director of International Relations Office, IRO, who's largely handling the um, international relations of other universities. There's a seminar that I've done with the laptop, so I'm on. Okay. So I apologize for the technical issue right now. Everything was smooth in the morning. Uh, once Prof. Rosita started speaking, we had some uh, glitch. So thank you for your patience. Okay. All right. Okay, let me just read up some of the questions that perhaps the um, speakers may have the answers already and you would like to keep that in their notes and address it during the talk. Those who has withdrawn from UMPHD program before, are they able to join this dual or joint PhD program? That's question number one from Michael. Um, we have how flexible is our regulations with regards to joint PhD, the harmonizing or MQA and UM requirements with the international partner universities? Maybe this is a question for session number one. Yeah, I hope um, Prof. Rosita is uh, listening. We also have question... Yeah, it's the same question from above. Oh, there's another one. If a person is teaching, okay. If a person is teaching in a university and he decided to start PhD in the same university, his or her PhD will have credibility as all the teaching faculty will be biased. Can you explain this? Regard? So these are some of the questions that was raised. We will not uh, necessarily address this right now, here and then. Um, I guess we can uh, restart the session. We would like to now invite Professor Norshina Muhammad Zay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Prof. Rosita, are you back? Yeah, I'm back. It's just that some interruption. I don't know okay. what happened now. So, okay. shall, we, shall we restart with Prof. Rosita? Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay. So to move to Prof Shina, but since you're back, so let's let's sorry about that just now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we lost you from the very beginning, Prof. From your assalamu alaikum, we have lost you. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> yes. Um, so perhaps uh you would like to restart the whole thing? So okay. sorry. Yeah, we couldn't we couldn't hear you and you just froze. The screen just frozen. Okay. okay Can you hear me? Okay, now. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay. Um uh, can, can you see it now? Can you hear me? Uh we your your screen is uh your camera is off. So perhaps let's keep it that way. Okay. Now. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. So I have to start all over again. Yes, please. Thank you. Bro. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I thought that he, you hear me. Okay. Okay. First of all, okay. The webinar is actually how to embark on the dual and joint PhD programs. Okay. And I know this webinar is on this PhD progress, but even though uh, our focus in this dual and PhD programs, just for your information in UM, we have six different types of collaboration programs. Okay, we have dual degree, joint degree, double degree, offshore, split site program, and franchise program. This six pro, uh, pro, uh, programs actually, this is the collaborative programs that are available in UN. Okay, so let me discuss on the uh, what is actually dual joint degree programs. Okay, so for joint degree, is actually one study programs. It's collaboration between two or more institution institutions, and uh, the the award will be only one award and one scroll. It means, but if uh, uh, the student will only get one scroll, but the scroll will be endorsed by the two institution. For example, UN with uh, New South Wales University and so on. So in this case, the student will only have one scroll. Okay, for dual degree. We have two study programs. 
from the same or similar field. Collaboration is involved collaboration between two institutions which have equal standing and the student will get two awards. One from UN or one from other institutions. Okay, and we have another type of program, they call double degree programs, where it's actually two, a two study program, can be different fields, and it's also collaboration between two institutions, which equal standings, and the student will get two awards uh, by both institutions. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we have the other types of collaborative programs. We have offshore, which is academic program offered fully or partially abroad, and the awarding body will be UN. And we also have franchise franchise program offered right by franchiser, which is UM, to franchisee to market product or edu education services. And this one involves royalty field and also the awarding body, the control it will be with by UN. Okay, and we have split site programs. This only refer to the student registered to doctoral or master, master's programs by research in UM. But if they have another like a joint supervision by other institutions, so uh, they will do research from uh, other university, but the award will be from UM. So we have these uh, six collaborative programs, okay? Okay, so where to start? How to start? For the first uh, things that you should do is actually you have to identify the potential area. What are the areas that you want to uh, do the collaborations? And it's also good if you have already your students or you already have the candidates to join this dual or join programs. And, and then after that, you identify the potential pro, uh, area, what you should do, you have to have a thorough evaluations on the financial assistance for the candidates, whether the student said candidate will have self-funding or university will fund it, whether you have a grant to fund the candidate and so on. And also you have to decide on the tuition fees. Uh, bench, you have to do the benchmarking regional or global institution, what kind of tuition fees and who's going to pay what, how much the other university will pay, how much UM will pay and so on. And actually the, the, one of the most imp important thing also, you have to make sure the institutional, the program that you want to collaborate already obtain the accreditation from the relevant body. For example, in UM, we have NQA accreditation. So the other party also have to have the relevant body that accredit that program uh, from their uh, uh, country. And then uh, by right, normally we are looking at the university that we are collaborate with is actually the, the university that have a ranking. Okay, the better the rank, uh, the, the higher the ranking, the better. And we have also in school also the, the person that... The I just university. went, there's a Zoom link, I click on it, I'm already in, you know. So can I just send you the Zoom link so that you can click on it? Okay, okay, bye. Okay. And uh, you have to make sure also, if possible, the area that you want to collaborate is actually the university that have is actually high rank in that area. And after you have this thorough evaluation, and then you can maybe you can decide on do the some discussion on how to do the uh, to draft the MOA uh, uh, with the partner institutions. Okay. So what are the processes? So after you have tentatively know which university, you already have the candidate, you already draft some preliminary MOA. So you have to make initial discussion, make appointment with the associate vice chancellor for global engagement uh, to ensure this at uh, the meeting will be the discussion to ensure that all the requirements by university, uh, Ministry of Higher Education, MQA, and other professional bodies, if relevant, are at hired. And then whatever the collaboration, it should be win-win situation for both institutions. And after that, there are three types of programs that you can do. It's actually a collaborative program for new academic program. This is when you just started. You don't have any MOA, you don't have any existing programs, and you want to start the dual or PhD programs. Another program, another type of uh, 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 program is collaborative program for an existing academic program. So you have, you already have a, a collaborative program with other institutions, but this time you want to do this collaborative, the same program, but with different institutions. 
So there's also this type of uh, collaborative program. Or there are also a program where you already have existing program, you just want to renew MOA with the same institutions. Okay, so there are three types of uh, uh, programs where uh, they have a slightly different procedures. Okay. So this is basically tentatively on what you should do. The first thing is actually identify either the program is actually new academic programs, existing academic programs, or to renew MOA with the, uh, to just to renew the MOA. You already have run that joint or PhD program, you just want to renew the MOA. Okay, this is actually on the PTJ sites. Okay, and then you apply to ABC, which is a uh, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Global Engagement for preliminary discussions. And then later on, after being approved and everything, you have to prepare the paperwork. But this is done by the PTJ, which is proposal, uh, the JKPT document with the structure and also the draft of MOA. And also, you also have to deal, JBIU also need to be, uh, this, uh, need to decide on the uh, proposed fee structure. And then after that, it will go to the Jawatan Kuasa uh, Curriculum, which is uh, actually the secretary will be SP Center. And then also the JYU, which is actually the secretary will be the BERSA. Okay. And then later on, after everything, it go for the Senate approval. And if it's a, the program is new program or new collaborative collaborative partner, you need to have approval to go to the JPT or Ministry of High, Educa High Education for the approval. Okay, so anything to do with this uh, uh, procedure and every for the joint and PhD programs, you can obtain from our website. Uh, if you go to the portal, uh, you will get this, all this information what I discussed just now and even more explanation on that. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Rosita. Okay, yeah. All right. I hope it's okay. Eh? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. That's a good introduction of the whole okay. dual. So we see where the dual and or joint PhD program sits yeah. in the um, University Malaya framework of um, supervision. So I would like now to invite uh, Professor Sheena. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Noraza. Um, oh, thank you so much. Yes, so Prof. Sheena is our Director of IRO of University of Malaya. And uh, over to you, Prof. Sheena. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning, everybody. So um, my role is to share with you what, how does IRO um, play a role in all this? Okay, so uh, let me share you um, my slides. Okay, so um, for IRO, our role is find it, uh, is actually finding what is your potential partner. So uh, my title today will be finding potential dual or jo uh, joint PhD partners. So um, just to share with you, um, as you, uh, Dr. Uh, Rosita, uh, Prof. Rosita had shared. Um, there are various um, uh, procedures that needs to go through um, pr uh, prior to um, making sure that your agreement is um, a signed deal. So, um, and it has to go through several um, uh, committees, such as the Jawatan Kuasa Yuran, um, uh, the Jawatan Kuasa Pengusaha Utama, so on and so forth. So my um, where I come from is to share with you what are the current partners uh, or institutions that we already have and it is active. And because um, why I'm sharing with you this is because the procedure is um, much quicker. If you've already identified your students, you have a potential supervisor already in hand, now what do you do? You need to identify if your agreement is active. So right now, we have actually seven partners that we have an active agreement, and this is with the Osaka University, 
the IIC University of Technology Cambodia, the Amir Kabir University of Technology in Iran, Swinburne University, uh, Liverpool, John Moore University. We have uh, Shia Kuala um, in Indonesia, your University of New South Wales and University of Taipei. So currently seven institution uh, agreements are active and we have and it's currently running with students. Okay, but we also have um, other potential partners which we've signed and it's already expired. And this I will explain to you shortly. So let me just share with you, these are the um, uh, faculties that are running the collaborative PhD programs, either joint, dual or split side. So for Faculty of Science, we have you know, Osaka University, and, um, uh, and this is in the field of, um, it's a broad uh, field. Uh, Faculty of Engineering, they have several um, agreements with uh, Liverpool, John Moore, Amikabe University, University Shia Kuala, uh, University of New South Wales, Australia, Sport Science at uh, University of Taipei, um, Swinburne University um, has an agreement with Umpadec, and then um, for uh, Universe, uh, Institute of Advanced Studies, we have uh, IIC, University of Technology, Cambodia, uh, Built Environment with Shia Kuala, as well as uh, Faculty of Law. So um, uh, for Shia Kuala, uh, it's primarily a split side agreement. So the split side agreement with Shia Kuala, you have with University uh, Faculty of Law, you have the Built Environment and the Faculty of Engineering. Okay, so as I said, we've actually partnered with 22 partner institutions. Okay, so um, there, there's from um, uh, four universities from Australia, uh, and then we've got two universities from Iran. We have two universities from Japan, three universities from Taiwan. Uh, we've got about six in um, United Kingdom and uh, three in France and uh, two in Belgium. So if there are any interests, um, to pursue any of this institution, uh, this will be much quicker because approval uh, only needs to go to the LPU level and it does not all need to go all the way to KPT. So if you've got any partners uh, from these various universities and you're interested to have a dual PhD with, um, with your partner in this institution, it will be so much easier. Okay, so, but we are also uh, having ongoing this um, uh, collaboration, uh, which is in the pipeline with um, two universities in Taiwan, which is the National Yang Min Chao Tung uh, University, um, with the potential host with Faculty of Medicine, as well as National Taiwan University. Okay, we have University of Loring for Faculty of Languages. And in United Kingdom, um, we have University of Liverpool with Faculty of Science. And in Australia, we have University of New South Wales with Faculty of Engineering and University of Southern Queensland. Okay, so um, these are already ongoing. Um, the discussions are in the pipeline and hopefully um, we'll be able to push this through to the next level um, to the JYU, the, um, uh, the LPU, as well as KPT. Yeah, so uh, the duration, if it's a brand new um, agreement, it does take time. All right. So now let me share with you over the years from the year of 2013 all the way to 2022, there have been uh, uh, quite a number of students coming from Faculty of Engineering, followed by Faculty of Medicine and Science and um, uh, Center of Sports and Exercise Sciences. And finally, from IAS, the Institute of Advanced uh, Studies. So um, as you can see, um, these numbers are not very high, but we, we are able to do more. And that is why we are encouraging many of you to start embarking on these uh, collaborative programs. Okay, so um, uh, this is just to share with you the, the names of the supervisors who've done it. So if you know anybody in the list and you are interested to 
have a discussion on how they do how they did it and um how how um were they able to successfully um get on board on this program they can also speak to them we have also speakers today that uh, will be able to share with you their success stories so please stay on um uh, till the end okay so um uh, my final slide here is if you have an expression of interest of this dual or joint phd programs okay scan this barcode it will it will share a link with you on the 22 partners that we have and then we can start discussions on um, your proposed um, field as well as trying to match make you with the right partners okay so this is with uh, just the 22 partners that we currently have all right so please um, let us know if you are um, you have a potential student you have a potential partner in already parked under this um, uh, please share with us um, how uh, and we will show with you uh, uh, introduce you to the uh, uh, the next level for us to um, push this through to um, so that it can happen uh, quite um, smoothly so for any uh, contact information you can call us or email us at our um, email the international at um.edu.my or look at our um, website international.um.edu.my. Uh, That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Shina. It was very nice of you to have that link over there, the QR code scan. And uh, people are asking that, can we please see Prof. Shina's QR code again? <laughs> okay. let's, leave, let's leave it on the screen for a while. Okay, sure. <laughs> And um, if you do already have the link, we will put it up on our chat section for everyone else to just click. But in the meantime, since I, I, I guess some of us are having their phones on, the, on their hands, but couldn't, couldn't um, catch the scan uh, in time. So let's have that a little bit more. Let's leave it here um, while we take questions from both Prof. Sheena and Prof. Uh, Rosita. Um, may I request that we also spotlight Prof. Rosita and I, 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 we already do have a few questions um, on the chat section so um, perhaps it's good if we could go through the questions right now or if anyone has um, any questions that would like to be raised um, verbally you also can do that just raise up your hands and we'll call you out okay um Okay, let's see. I'll start with the last one up. Okay. Okay, there's one from Amira Asmadi. Is it possible to do this dual program under SLAP scholarship? Prof. Rosita or maybe Prof. Rosita? I think it's quite possible. I think it can be done. Okay. Okay, okay. can be done. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, from Zuhaib Hassan, if a person is teaching in a university and he decided to start PhD in the same university, his or her PhD will have credibility as all the teaching faculty will be biased. And the second one is, kindly, my humble request to guide about PhD on scholarship for Pakistani students. I'm interested for PhD on a scholarship basis. Okay, perhaps um, a short note from um, anyone, uh, Prof. Rosita or Prof. Sheena. Maybe this is a question for, for us to take further. Uh, can I request Zohaib to um, email us your question? Not sure if the right person is here to answer that. This has to do with um, PhD scholarship, yeah? So, yeah. Yes. Um, I, can in, I, yeah? I can just share a little bit. Yes, um, please. Uh, as, as Prof. Uh, Rosita mentioned, the funding needs to come um, and agreed by the two partners, okay? So, if you have a research grant, um, that you can support your student in uh, University Malaya. Um, 
is uh, something that we encourage. And if you can agree with um, your partner and if they have a research grant and um, what they can cover is also um, very, um, is very important. So you have to find ways on how to um, make sure your students are uh, actually, um, uh, uh, you have to look at how much you need for their um, ex uh, expenses, their bench fees, the visas, all right? And that's why the agreement is very uh, crucial. Uh, the agreement must state how much that uh, needs to be covered, okay? Um, in terms of scholarship, I think um, maybe Prof. Yong, she's the best person who, um, to, to speak on this. Um, uh, and uh, um, Prof. Yong, do you have anything to add? Okay. If you have any unanswered questions, you can email to uh, adec at um.edu.my and we try to redirect you to the right person. I'm not sure if Prof. Yang is around. Prof. Shina, let's uh, we try to move on to the next question. Uh, okay, this, is, this one is for Prof. Uh, Prof. Shina. For Swinburne University of Technology Australia, how about other faculties or departments such as mechanical engineering? Is it much quicker for the process? I guess the question is to reframe, to be, to, for me to um, try to reframe. If you already have such with another faculty, is it much easier to just do it yes. in another faculty or another department? So that's why we encourage you to look at the, part, the existing partners that we already have. The process doesn't need to go all the way to KPT. It's just uh, primarily for you to discuss about how are you going to um, um, get the funding for your student to to be able to um, complete their studies both in UM as well as abroad. Yes. Yeah. If, so, uh, so my, okay, if, I, yeah. if I may add a little bit, I think the, it will be much simpler and the approval is only up to the UM level, uh, yeah, up to the Senate. Yeah. Because the MOA and the next year will be different, huh? with the new, new different student and so on. So, yeah. Okay, so the, 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 I hope that answers your question, Dr. Chan. That was Dr. Chan from Biomedical Engineering. Uh, Dr. Inli from um, Engineering as well, Biomedical If we have a dual PhD program with the university oh. or a or faculty, can that be applied to other faculty? I think that's the same, same, yeah. the same, same note, yeah, Dr. Inli? So Dr. Inli and Dr. Chan, they are thinking the same, asking the same question. Dr. Elaine. Or oh, Miss Elaine. So for this dual or joint and double degrees, both institutions would already have signed an MOU that formally uh, agreed to this collaboration. That's that's what we understand, yeah. Yes. Okay. So um, it's so I, I guess this webinar and this first session is to introduce what's what is available in UM <clears throat> and what are the potential that we can expand it to using what we already have or maybe we want to expand to the ones that are not yet in which we understand will take uh, a much longer and higher process to be dealt with so i guess um that's a good uh, summary let's see if we have any other new questions okay this one was from michael i'm not sure um, those who has withdrawn from UM PhD program before, are they able to join this dual or joint PhD program? Maybe a question for Prof. Rosita. I think, it's, I think it's quite possible, but you have to change the supervisor and also the area, I guess. Yeah, you Is cannot do the same similar uh, research uh, topics, research area and similar supervisor. Okay. And then I think you have to start all over again. Mm, so it's restarting the whole process. Yes, yes. We uh, look at you fresh, lah, yeah? Yeah, and then with different supervisor, definitely. Mm -hmm. so we, we know that someone did, somehow it didn't work out in the first time. Yeah, yes. Uh, okay, Michael, I hope that answers your question. Um, from Sanjay, Sanjay Rampal, doctor, or I'm, I'm not sure. How flexible is our regulations with regards to joint PhD? 
the harmonizing of MQN and UM requirements with the international partner universities. This has been touched a little bit by Prof. Sheena earlier. Maybe um, Prof. Sheena would like to rephrase your for, for, for us to un address this question. Um, and like um, what um, Prof. Rosita mentioned, you have to make sure that the programs are accredited, right? So um, MQA on our side and whatever body on um, your partner's side. Um, and, um, and of course, uh, it has to be of a certain ranking. Uh, so we, if possible, choose partners that are, um, uh, you know, good, of good standing uh, in terms of ranking, as well as the program needs to be accredited. Yes, um, how flexible it is, uh, I cannot comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because um, that will depend on the different bodies. Okay. Okay, Prof. Rosita, would you like to add anything on that, that flexibility? I don't think there is any issue. If the both programs are accredited by accredited by all both relevant parties, like for us, MQA and other relevant, like mentioned by the uh, Prof. Norshina, I don't think it's, it shouldn't be any problem at all. There is no, you know, as long as follow all the procedure, that's the most important thing. Like you have to make sure both the program yeah. are, are accredited by the relevant yeah. bodies. That's all. Okay. Scrolling down towards the bottom part, we have one from <clears throat> Dr. Elaine or Miss Elaine. Will the student have to pay double fees then? One to UM and the other one to the partner university. It Since depends. Okay. I think it depends on what are the arrangement agreement between the two institutions. Okay. So it depends uh, on the two, yeah? yeah. I don't think they have to pay double. Maybe we, if they register the first semester here, they may pay th that, that amount of fees. And when they go to the other institution, they have to pay that semester. So they don't have to pay double. I don't think they have to pay double. Hmm. I think it depends on the MOA agreement. Okay. okay. One from Dr. Mastura. May I know how long will the application take place if there is no MOU between the universities? I'm planning for a dual PhD in UM and University of Aberdeen. I'm expecting to register for a PhD in UM this coming March. This coming March? I think it's not going to be timely to register soon for a dual PhD. That's true. Yeah. I think it depends on the PTJ, how soon they can do settle the MOA, how soon they soon the, get the candidates and everything, and how soon they can, you know, uh, complete all the forms or the requirements, okay? Uh. Okay, so uh, maybe an advice for Miss um, Puan Mastura or Dr. Mastura is to ex um, fill in the um, expression yeah. of interest mm -hmm. form and also uh, write to us. If because it, it sounds like it's happening very very soon, so yeah. that uh, and I think that's why it's very important for us to listen to the success stories, okay, and their mm -hmm. challenges. Yes, um, in the next session. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Let's look forward to that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um. Let me just go through. Uh, there's one from Lila Quran. What about with other private universities in Malaysia? For example, with University of Nottingham, Malaysia. Is that a potentially good dual PhD or joint PhD program? Can do, yeah. Do, yeah? Okay. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm. From uh, Norha, in terms of the list, where can we refer to the latest reference of universities that have already signed MOU and ranking? Uh, okay. Perhaps uh, this uh, procedural question, maybe write to IRO. Yes, um, yeah. we have the list. Okay, so if you just scan the code, there will be um, a list of all the um, partners that we've already have um, a, a, a sign agreement. And if you uh, and if that is what you um, have in mind, that it be so much easier. We can um, proceed with um, either if it's a, a expired agreement, we can start renewing it. Um, uh, or an in inactive one, make it active. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Shina. Um, I'll take uh, two, three more questions now. We have one from um, WM Tilakaran Karatni. 
Pasal di- okay. I guess you didn't join from the beginning, Mr. or Sir. What is the difference between a dual degree and a double degree? They look similar. Okay, so we have covered that actually. And um, would Prof. Rosita would like to answer in a very short, <laughs> concise okay. way? Dual, okay, dual degree. I think almost the same thing. It's just that dual degree of similar area and double degree is actually slightly different area. Oh, okay. Okay. That's a good answer. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Area, research area, yeah. We mean research area, yeah. Research area. Similar research area or um two different research research areas. And then they both have two scrolls from okay. both uh, university. Okay. okay. From Dr. Chan, how about the final thesis submission? Does the student need to submit two theses for both universities? In some cases, the universities implement different writing or format. Can I advise? Okay. Normally it depends also on MOA what's been decided on the MOA, okay? So normally, most normally we actually request only the student to only submit one thesis, which is agreed by both uh, university. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay, one last one from uh, Nazrik Ahmad. Sorry if I don't get your doctor correctly. Assalamualaikum and good morning, esteemed speakers. I'd like to know if I am currently doing my PhD in UM first semester, is it still possible for me to go for the dual PhD program? That's a very enticing uh, question. Um, Prof. Rosita, maybe? I think it's quite possible, provided that you already have the MOA, you, the, your supervisor already have a partner from other institutions that already been actually, uh, have already partnered and have an MOA with UM. I think it's quite possible because it's actually the process is internal, approval also internal. Isn't it, uh, Prof. China? Uh, yes, uh, uh, there may be, um, you know, agreement on the um, how much money they need to spend. Yeah. Uh, that's that's um, that's where the discussions um, need to uh, agree upon. Okay, so I guess um, we had two last questions, but they are repeated questions. So I hope Dr. Elaine and Dr. Andrew Chan don't mind. Um, that we don't address your question personally, I think because the answers are, are by listening to the answers. One is about the doing the um, dual PhD in the middle of the candidature. Oh, eh, baru tahu lah ada dual PhD. Can I, can I, can we, can we do that while we are already in? So that's uh, just addressed just now. And uh, from Dr. Elaine is about the um, uh, transferring. If you already have everything, is to transfer or to, to to create new one in um different faculty i think that's we have um addressed that it's very doable okay i think we've addressed um all the question that has been raised if you still have questions um do write to us we will if we can't answer it adec can't answer it um ourselves we will direct you to the right um officer to help you and don't forget if you just um join don't forget to scan the expression of interest um um, QR code earlier and uh, look out for our link so that you can register your interest and we know that you are in this and we would like to help you more yeah so with that um, if there's no other question let me just quickly check if there's any hands raised any burning question towards the end okay it looks like there's no all right so with that I would like to sincerely thank Prof Sheena and Prof Rosita for your time and um, introducing all of us to this dual and joint I, I'm sure this is a large potential for all of, all of us to explore some of us may be able to do it very easily but because we don't know it then we didn't go into that direction so I hope this will be we'll have a, a jump in numbers of dual or joint PhD programs after this thank you so much Prof Sheena and Prof Rosita um, we we'll take uh, ten min- uh, five minutes break before we start session number two, which will be moderated by Prof. Yong. Okay, so I'll see you guys in five minutes. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Welcome back to our webinar on how to embark on dual or join PhD programs. With us now, we have... Prof. Yong, Professor Dr. Yong Zulina Zubairi, Associate Vice Chancellor, Global Engagement of University Malaya. So, Prof. Uh, Yong will be moderating this session. 
Session 2, Charting a Successful Co-Supervision on Dual or Joint PhD Programme. So, without further ado, I would like to invite Prof. Yong Zolina to take over the stage. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Naraza. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. You see me an emoji. Everything is fine. Okay, brilliant. So, uh, Dr. Ashril is uh, nodding his head. So, I, I presume everything is fine. Right. Um, first of all, uh, welcome everyone uh, to this session. But before I proceed, I would like to extend my special thanks to um, the uh, key people behind this. Number one is EDEC. Uh, the team has been kindly enough um, helping us to uh, organize this. And number two is my, uh, my backbone, a strong backbone, the team from International Relations Office, headed by uh, Professor Shina, who actually wants to take this uh, even further. And I believe uh, we can all do uh, this. Uh, I'm sure we will be able to assist everyone. Um. Yes. Uh, okay. And um, so this is where we are. Okay. The second session is where we bring in the two, I would say, the heroes, heroines in this. We will bring into the spotlight Dr. Elin Lee and uh, Dr. Ashril, who have been doing this all this while. They have gone through the difficult times when the university itself is trying to put this um, dual PhD program in place. So we will hear from them to see what are the challenges so what, if they can share with us the secret, because these two are not the ordinary, you know, uh, people like us, who have actually go against all odds to venture into something that is really unknown at that point in time. So how did they put forward? How do they get the, the partner over there? And how do they get the buy-in from the students? These are key issues that I think all of us would want to know. And of course, at the end of the day, what is described as a successful partnership. These two venture two different parts of the globe. Dr. Yilin Lee has gone down south, down under, to explore, see what are the strengths of the academics down under, what are the benefits working together with universities down under. For Dr. Asri, on the other hand, he has gone to the UK, universities in UK, even more challenging, especially on the parts on the finance. Some of the questions have been raised. How did he get by that? So let's see what they have got to say. Now, I would like to call upon all of you to get your questions rolling in because really we need to tap on their, on their expertise, on their experience, so that we will not make the same mistake if we're going to work on this one. Okay, so let me start by first bringing to the spotlight Dr. Eileen Lee from the Faculty of Engineering. She has got a number of graduates already from this program. She's got now in the pipeline and she's going for more. She's really going for the numbers, very big numbers. So perhaps you might want to share a little bit about yourself and um, how did you start to identify the partners and perhaps the important information that our listeners here would like to know. So over to you, Eileen Lee. Thank you very much, Prof. Yong. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, perfect, Dr. Eileen Lee. Okay, I'll share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, so thank you very much for listening. Um, so here I'm going to share with you my experience of handling um, joint PhD programs with the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. So I'll start by saying this, um, doing research is hard. Doing research in a developing nation like Malaysia yet remain relevant is even harder. I experienced two totally different research experiences during my postgraduate years. I did a master by research in the University of Malaya with very limited resources 20 years ago, zero research funding, almost no expertise. And I experienced abundant resources when I did my PhD in the University of New South Wales. So after my 
master's degrees, I was actually at my lowest self-esteem because um, people said that I'm doing something which they have done it 20 years ago. But I regained the confidence that I've once lost through my three and a half year PhD experience. And these sweet and sour research experiences that I have had motivated me to strive to create a good research environment for my postgraduate students and postdocs with a dream that despite all limitations and challenges in a developing nation, we could still produce confident and quality graduates. To realize my dream, I set up Asian Cardiac Engineering Lab in 2012. It started with three master's students working on different cardiovascular modeling projects, a website, and an empty lab. So with no funding for lab renovation, my very dedicated postgraduate students that you've seen here um, managed to set up a proper lab for ourselves. To, more, to know more details about Asian Cardiac, please visit our website. So how do we start um, this dual PhD program? It was actually started in 2013. Um, at that time, I've got an HIR grant. So I thought that I could have flexible funding for patients, uh, for students' uh, attachment overseas. Um, as you know, HRR funding is very flexible in terms of overseas attachment. Uh, and at that time, um, UM was pushing for dual programs with overseas institutions. So I grabbed that opportunity, uh, talked to Prof. Camila, the Dean of I Institute of Graduate Studies at that time, and we started the paperwork in 2013. It took us about um, more than six months to sort out the paperwork uh, from MOU to joint candidature agreement to finally registering students on that program. So we started with two PhD students who registered in 2014. And these students uh, have actually graduated uh, under the dual PhD scheme. So the number of PhD graduates that we had um, that have graduated under this scheme are four of them, and we have currently three ongoing candidates. The graduate students have managed to secure jobs here in either the industry or academic institutions no later than three months after their YVA. So how do, we, how do I identify potential partners for a dual PhD program? Um, for my case, it is very simple because I graduated from UNSW, and my ex-supervisors, um, I have actually three of them, together with their postdocs, have now become the joint supervisors of my own PhD students in UNSW. So with this dual PhD program, I managed to maintain a close collaboration with them over the past 10 to 15 years. So in addition, I've also expanded my collaboration network to other universities, um, such as the University of Queensland, Texas Heart Institute in US, Curtin University and Kunming University through my existing network. So these are just some of the examples. So basically existing network, networks network is something that you can look into. So for these universities, um, we have not gone to the extent of signing MOU or dual PhD programs um, as it involved quite extensive paperwork. Uh, instead, we had joint student supervisions and short-term attachments up to a year uh, for postdocs, for example, in Texas Heart, um, and three months in Queensland. So all this was supported by uh, research grants um, that I had um, at different time, point of time. Um, so other than that, um, how to identify potential partners, I think... Um, I also work with other research groups who work in the same research area as I am. So an example is uh, with Imperial College London, uh, where I had a joint Newton funding with them to work on a three-year research project. The PhD student working on this project underwent um, three-month attachment twice um, in Imperial College before MCO, and she has just submitted her thesis recently. Um, so I think identifying potential partners always start with um, identifying common research projects uh, and then start small before we actually jump into something big, bigger like a program. So um, the next question is, what are some of the tips uh, and challenges for successful joint supervision? 
Uh, the first challenge is that because the student would be located in two different universities throughout not a very long period, a three to four years PhD. So how do we ensure that there is a smooth continuation of the PhD project while the candidate switches location between UN and UNSW? So to address this, there is a need to have a well-defined proposal agreed by both parties and this would include proper planning on what the candidate would do in each institution according to the available resources and when will the attachment take place. And these details should be outlined before the candidature or within the first six months of PhD candidature. Um, second, access to supervisor in the partner institution who may be very busy. Um, normally, supervisors with the rank of professor in renowned institutions are known to be very busy. To ensure that the supervisor in the partner institution is aware of the student's progress, uh, my students send regular emails with reports, at least once a month update if possible, to the partner supervisor, and we have meetings whenever necessary. In addition to these initiatives of sending reports, or progress, it is a good practice to actually have a second supervisor um, who can be a postdoc research fellow attached to the professor in the partner institution who can help with the supervision. Lastly, uh, money. Okay, funding to purchase research con consumables required to conduct research activities in the partner institution. Um, normally, this would have to come from the supervisor's research grants in the partner institution because grants is normally non-transferable across countries. Um, so this can come from research grants from the partner supervisor or from joint research grants, for example, Newton Fund. Therefore, it is very important that the PhD project is related to an active project of the partner supervisor's research team. Finally, what is so good about the joint PhD program? Um, number one, the ability to attract the brightest students, which is, I think, the most important criterion for good research outcome. All of our dual PhD students were top students in their class and had excellent academic track record since young. Second, access to world-class facilities and network, which is very important to conduct high-impact research especially in the engineering discipline, which demands high technical skills. With the dual program, students have access to high quality postdocs and research environment in the partner institution. This definitely speed up their research progress and keep the students motivated. So although we spend some money for students' attachment through UM funding or my research grants, the return of investment, I would say, is is more than double or triple. For example, we use the high performance computing facilities and software in our partner institution. This alone would cost more than a few hundred thousands throughout the three year period. And in addition, I think postdoc is very important. So in overseas institution postdocs, they have a lot of postdocs and research team, which we can actually make use of uh, in terms of helping with research progress. If we have to recruit a postdoc in UM, that would actually cost much more money. And most importantly, it is not easy, as we know, to get a good postdoc which can stay for more than a year here in Malaysia. Um, fourth, having joint su student supervision through a dual, dual PhD program is a very effective way to maintain close collaboration uh, with partner institution. Um, personally, I think that if we want to maintain collaboration through uh, bilateral visits or workshops. Uh, this method is actually quite not very sustainable. Um, lastly, of course, um, graduates from uh, this dual PhD program uh, would, would have better chance when it comes to job applications. So, so far our graduates are, are very highly sought after. So our research students have also created their own network with students from different universities across the world during their study through their research attachments and participations in conferences. So research does not need to be a boring and lonely experience. It can be fun when you are surrounded by the right people. So setting up and maintaining a dual PhD program um, definitely requires tremendous effort in terms of paperwork and funding. So here, I would really like to thank the HR funding and IPS at that time under Prof. Camila for initiating this. And also the great support from TNCA office. 
uh, Prof. Young's office, IRO and AASC. Um, so without all this help, um, I think it's quite impossible to, to push forward a joint PhD program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the information. Very useful to everyone, but I'm sure everybody has got further questions. But as you are typing the questions, let me just give a, a general overview when you want to partner with a um, academics um, in any university in Australia. One thing about Australia is that if they have this funding where um, a student would spend at, at least a year, correct me, yeah, uh, at least a year over there in the UK, they will waive the tuition fee. And in some, they can even provide um, uh, funding to, to pay for their livelihood over there. So that is generally the, the support that the Australian government gives. For us as a supervisor, it kind of eases the burden in the sense that when the students go over there, we do not have to worry whether he or she is able to, to pay for their livelihood as well as the fees. Right. And then... Um, Dr. Inili is very lucky in the sense that she's very familiar with UNSW and from there on to get the trust, to get the uh, networking you know, going on on the research area, it falls naturally. But for some of you who are looking, that's where the International Relations Office comes in. So what we need from your end is your name and the areas that you would like to, to uh, work on. And if you have any preference for any universities, they can do the matchmaking. We can arrange for that. So all we need is to get as much information from your end to at least start doing the matchmaking per se and see how it goes from there on. All right. Now, there's a question earlier on, on the students. Where do they register? As far uh, for all dual PhD students, as soon as they register, they will be earmarked by AASC as a dual PhD. So meaning to say that they need to be registering uh, to UM throughout, be it they are in, in, uh, in UK or other parts of the world. So their status as a UM student has got to be active. So there is no changes. There's no difference whether they are, you know, as if I have got another student who's doing the PhD all throughout in UM and also the dual. So that it's easy for the students. Now, what kind of support at the central level that we provide? Number one, the AASC team has got a um, dedicated person who really looks into the, uh, the uh, study period of all dual PhD program. For example, um, the, the challenge of a dual PhD program is that the candidate will need to satisfy both institutions. For case in Australia, the requirement for UM is you must have a viva, you must have two publications in the science track. So that one, we will not compromise. For Australia, whatever the requirement of the university, we will follow. And these things have got to be laid out to the candidate. Yeah? So uh, if there has to be a, a X number of presentations, so that, that student will need to comply the requirement at both ends. Okay? Now, um, I shall open, uh, Dr. Ilili, uh, Il would you like to add on, on anything that you feel uh, you might have missed out in your presentation, adding to what from my comments? Thanks, Prof. Young. Uh, yeah, so about tuition fee, um, we, we are really lucky that UNSW waived the tuition fee, uh, but actually it does not apply to all Australia universities um, because recently I actually, I actually tried to uh, initiate one with Macquarie University in Australia. Um, and I talked to my collaborator there. Um, he said that um, they, they would have to, the individual students would have to apply for scholarship um, for that to be waived. But of course, the scholarship um, would also cover their living costs. So that means their tuition fee and living costs at the same time. Uh, but it's very competitive. That means it's actually to all. So it, it's, it's just like you, you're trying to apply to international overseas universities, the same procedure. Um, so I think, I think UM here, we are very lucky that at that time when we signed the agreement, 
it's it's written that the tuition fee is waived and it still applies now because the tuition fee can be very expensive. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for the clarification. Yeah. So now, so that's how it is um, with regard to managing the um, uh, student uh, in a uh, dual PhD program in the Australia. Now, let's move on. Thank you very much, Inili. Um, we shall uh, put you on a hold, but by everyone, please get the questions coming in. So I would like to bring in the next speaker, Dr. Ashraya from the uh, Sport Science here, yeah? Center for Sports and Science Exercise. So Dr. Ashraya will share with us his experience partnering with um, universities in the UK and um, how does it, what, what's the winning secret and what are the advantages and what are the challenges that he faced in, um, in supervising? Perhaps Dr. Azri, if you can start by sharing uh, with the audience a little bit about yourself, your field, and also um, the, your experience on this one. Over to you. Can you hear me, uh, Prof. Young? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, salam alaikum, uh, everyone, and very good morning. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, ADEC and IRO for organizing this uh, timely um, webinar. And special thanks to Prof. Yong Zulina as well for uh, getting me on board, uh, to, uh, me asking me to share some of my experiences. Um, so uh, my background is uh, I graduated uh, from St. Andrews University, Scotland, uh, with a bachelor in uh, uh, in science and medical. Then I pursue my uh, master's and PhD uh, at Essex University uh, in, in, in England um, in the area of uh, uh, biochemistry of exercise and physiology. Um, so, okay, that's my, my background. So I have a, a bit of connection uh, with, the, with, with the UK uh, universities. Um, but I would just like to correct uh, uh, Prof. Young a little bit because I started, um, uh, if I can get the slides to move. Okay, I, I started my um, dual PhD uh, uh, work actually uh, with the uh, University of Sydney. So I started in 2008 uh, with uh, uh, under UM and University of Sydney Go to Tell program. I wouldn't say so much because I think Dr. Inli has, uh, you know, has explained uh, very well uh, all the um, challenges and benefits actually uh, from uh, partnering with an Australian university. Um, but um, but I just like to highlight in in 2008, you know, I mean, um, at that point, uh, UM just started uh, to venture. I think UM started to venture 2004, uh, something that I can correct me, uh, Prof. Young. I think 2004, um, then uh, 2008, we, together with the medical faculty, we, we, we drafted the, the, the documents uh, under uh, Tan Sri uh, Datuk Rafia, I think that time, I think Tan Sri Rafia Salim, kan? Uh, at that time, and then we, uh, we managed to get a candidate. And, um, and again, I managed to secure uh, an RU grant uh, for for uh, for this uh, joint work, and then we uh, we we started the the documentation, which took more than a year uh, to, because I think Australian were uh, were I mean this what to tell is quite well known in Australia, but this was the first time to work with UM, and um, and uh, we had to uh, you know uh, mesh the um requirement and australian requirement like they don't have viva and uh, uh, the, the the thesis is the whole thing you know for for examination purposes um and um, i think we managed to overcome uh, uh, all that and then we this is an example Gana, of the certificate from uh, university of sydney so, so if you have a you know a joint uh, or do a PhD program, so you get two uh, certificates, and um, uh, and in initially, I think uh, what uh, UM suggested was to have uh, two logos in one piece of certificate, but I think University of Sydney was a bit uh, reluctant because uh, each of their uh, certificate has got microchip and it has uh, security attached to it, so they don't want to uh, to to duplicate. Uh, I think 
it, it is quite costly. So we ended up having uh, two sets, uh, as I'm showing you now. So okay, uh, so that is with uh, my experience with Australian University. So that went uh, uh, pretty well uh, in you know in overall. You know, uh, although we have some hiccups uh, um, on the tenure, how long the student has to stay there, and at the end, the student had to stay there for two and a half years, and then spend. Uh, just six months in UM, but extended uh, her uh, candidature for about a year because some of the studies they need to, to 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 you know to be to be carried out in UM as well. Okay, um, moving on. So uh, next in 2013, um, so we ventured uh, to the UK and um, we started with uh, LJMU Liverpool John Moore University. Um, and then we have uh, uh, with Liverpool John Moore University. Um, it is through engineering faculty uh, we, we we got uh, in touch uh, with uh, potential supervisors, and we got to know that uh, LJMU has a huge uh, sports science faculty, uh, and they call it the Research Institute for Sport and Exercise Sciences. Um, they have over uh, 200 uh, staff, including postdocs and, um, uh, and PhD students. So it's, it, is, it is huge um, uh, faculty. Um, and we also found out that, you know, uh, when we are trying to identify universities in the UK, we based on the UK RAE ranking, as well as the QS ranking by subjects. And uh, Liverpool John Moore, uh, uh, was at that point uh, top three in the UK RAE ranking. So it's very important that we work with the uh, uh, with the prestigious and you know growing uh, faculty uh, because RAE takes into uh, takes into account the five year projection and how uh, the the faculty is progressing. So um, so so with uh, LGMU. So I partnered with Dr. Sarina Hanim. Uh, member of my faculty my, uh, uh, from Center of Sports and Exercise Sciences. And we have uh, Dr. Neil and Prof. Claire Stewart from LGMU to partner um, based on the, the research areas that we, 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 we agreed on and, um, and we had candidate. And here as well, uh, for LGMU, uh, our candidate was from TAR UC. So um, part of the fees was paid by TAR UC. Um, and I must highlight with UK University, uh, they require bench fees. So it is, it is important that the, the potential supervisors from UM has, the, uh, you know, has some funding. So I, I had uh, RU grant at that point as well to pay part of this and as well as the other um, uh, dual PhD uh, program, which I will highlight in a while. Okay. Um, and then uh, this is a certificate with Liverpool John Moores University. Uh, the UM um, uh, certificate, I think, will be issued soon because th this candidate will uh, convocate uh, next month. Uh, next, uh, my experience with the uh, Labra University. Labra University is ranked uh, by subject under. QS ranking uh, number one at the moment, so it is a, it's a you know, it's very prestigious uh, university, and again, it's a, it's a research center uh, for uh, sports and exercise for the UK. Uh, so they, they have a lot of national athletes, and they have got, uh, uh, I think, over eighty Olympians uh, studying at uh, Lampere University. So it's, a, uh, it's again, it's another uh, big faculty with more than uh, two hundred uh, members. Uh, and here uh, I partnered with uh, Dr. Louis James from uh, from uh, LU from Labra, and um, uh, we we with Labra we pick uh, uh, from the QS uh, QS ranking, and then we 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 choose the best supervisor. And I think uh, Eileen uh, uh, Inley rightly pointed that it is important uh, to work with people who has time. Uh, to spend uh, for for the student, you know, to to to, to check the progress because if you get a, a renowned professor, because you know, apparently Labra has uh, has a lot of renowned professors, uh, uh, but we chose to work with uh, a, a, a budding scientist so that he has he can spend more time, and that has uh, chosen to be uh, uh, proven to be a fruitful decision. 
So, um, so this is a certificate uh, from um, Loughborough University. We had our, this is from our slap slide uh, candidate. So yeah, that, I think there was a question on slap slide whether they can do a dual PhD program. Yes, you can do a dual PhD program. And yet again, right, the supervisors must have a, uh, because dual PhD uh, from the slap slide, it doesn't cover bench fees. So bench fees must come from the supervisor's research grant. And then you, ha you have to transfer I think UM, the Bandahari can work this out uh, to, to, to transfer the funding to, uh, to LU or any UK universities if you partner with them. Okay, so, uh, um, you know, coming to what I have been tasked to, to kind of discuss uh, and uh, bring to, uh, uh, to, to, to highlight some of the, my experiences. Um, how, how you get into, uh, you know, choose a, uh, the, the supervisor or the area, and you must really need to know the diversity of your research, you know, for, for, for each of your candidate, because every program is tailor-made. You may have two students, uh, you know, but, you know, in the same, uh, same project, but, you know, it has to be tailor-made because then you, you must look at the diversity. And of course, in the UK, uh, you are exposed to, uh, you know, cutting edge and multidisciplinary research, which has always been the focus of UM. Uh, you know, uh, and sports science, especially uh, even now, uh, um, you know, uh, we have a lot of collaboration with uh, engineering faculty, for example, and uh, sports um, medicine from uh, uh, our medical faculty. So it is, uh, it is multidisciplinary and then we need to embed this, you know, like, and we need to choose that, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a potential project that allows this to be expanded. Um, and we also choose that program structure similar uh, with UM. I think with UK, most of the UK universities, we don't have that much problem with the, with the structure because they also have the, you know, kind of, uh, they call it seminaries and uh, candidature seminar seminars. And, um, but uh, they also have VIVA. So both universities uh, require VIVA. So we can do one VIVA uh, for uh, in UM because the UM is a host university. So it's a home for, for the, the, the candidate. And um, uh, I think that there's a difference between the number of uh, examiners. Uh, UK requires two examiners. Uh, for example, they need uh, an external examiner and an internal examiner. But in, in UM, uh, as, as we know, the structure is three examiners. So I think they, we, we managed to, 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 solve it, to solve that problem. And I think they accepted that we, it's okay to have three and the, uh, well, the more the merrier, they said. You know? um, and um, another challenge is getting the MOA because the two universities that we work with, LGMU, uh, LGMU wasn't, wasn't too, too bad because we, we, as I mentioned, we got the, um, the contact through engineering faculty. So we use the template uh, by, uh, you know, uh, this was done by engineering faculty. So we just amend uh, one or two uh, items and then uh, it was ready to be carried out. And then, but with, uh, with Labra University, it took uh, almost a year uh, because uh, I think <laughs> the, the requirement is just, you know, uh, they just go through line by line, word by word. And then, the, 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 you know, it, uh, I think the, the, the discussion between Prof. Kamila and our legal unit and their side, you know, I think that was just eight months, I think uh, over 200 emails uh, that was. Uh, where I was sitting in, you know, uh, in the, those emails. So it is, it is a tedious process. We almost gave up because it just took too long, you know. And the candidate, uh, because we had a slap slide candidate, and he has started the slap slide, and you know, he's really spent like a year waiting for the documents to be to be ready. And you know, but we were we were persistent um, to to get this through uh, because Labra is QS, uh, uh, you know, uh, rank number one by subjects, you know. So we 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 have to partner. Uh, we search universities so that we are, we you know, we are kind of at par. Uh, in, in a way, they accept us as, a, you know, as a, another research institu institution that they will work, want to work with. Um, and again, uh, the bench fees, uh, they require bench fees. So it's about uh, around 5,000 to 6,000 pounds per year. Uh, it's quite a lot of money. Uh, but I got a RU grant, uh, thanks to Prof. Nosada, uh, uh, to... Um, of course, it went through the, the normal processes, the vetting and the, the presentations and whatnot. Um, um, 
And then in the UK, we also realize that quality-based research and, and it is not time-based research. So they don't believe in our GOT. So <laughs> we had a lot of uh, a lot of arguments and you know uh, and uh, they, they they still think that a PhD is around four years, you know, uh, or five even, you know. Uh, and they, they don't think that GOT should be uh, the uh, the benchmark here saying that you have to finish in three years, you know. So here is a philosophy, the philosophy of a PhD can really be uh, understood uh, if a student go through this system because the quality-based research in their, in their perspective is like you, you start with something sim simple, you know, you do a simple experiment to get the foundation, to get the background right. And then you move on from to, to another study and to another study. And then you can understand and propose certain mechanism that is underlying whatever changes that you observe. So I think, I think with that, right, the student would be more appreciative of what it means by a doctor uh, of philosophy, you know, because it, it is a whole process. It's very philosophized, you know, uh, it, it takes you through. Uh, and then you have to defend it at different levels, you know, and at the end, during your viva, you know, they will ask you, you know, you have done all these and so what, you know, then they want you to explain, you know, and uh, usually a viva process in the UK is quite long, but since we do it in Malaysia, uh, it is uh, a bit shorter. And uh, I think um, Dr. Eli also mentioned about communication. I think communication is very important. We need to keep abreast with the student progress. I think I always, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, email or uh, arrange Skype with the student as well as with the supervisors uh, in the UK uh, to get their feedbacks and, you know, and uh, way forward and or any troubles, troubleshooting. So because sometimes we need to send uh, uh, some samples, whatever, from Malaysia to the UK, uh, and then you just got to go through the custom and whatnot. You know, it's a it, it's a huge thing. It, even to send, you know, uh, you know, um, some samples from plant extract is you have to go through the documentation. Uh, it's horrendous. You know, it took months and months and uh, various offices and um, um, and it's very difficult. And you must make sure that this is all sorted so that the UK will just receive it. You know, uh, and they don't have much trouble. Uh, in, in, in getting it because otherwise they have to go and get it through their custom and then it's a, it's a long story. Um, lastly, is they are always supportive with your demands and stuff, but yet they are demanding. They are very subtle, you know, they, they, their style is, right, they say, they say yes, you know, blah, 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 and then they say, okay, then we have to do this. And then you so when you see the, 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 the discussion will always lead to their side and then it's going to be very laborious and you know and and it requires quite a lot of effort from the student you know so you know like few studies got to be done and then this links to this and uh, i think i think if you have done a phd uh, in the uk you may appreciate what i'm saying but uh, uh, it is a different concept at times you know uh, where certain studies require only like certain studies in malaysia you have one study and and they, one huge study and then you may break it up in the parts but in the UK, it's always a different studies and different settings and try, trying to understand it in different ways, you know, and they're very classical uh, in, in that thoughts, you know. Okay, uh, my second point is how to make super supervision effective. First is the candidate selection. So here, right, um, it is a very difficult uh, decision usually, like how do you want to choose the best candidate for, for certain program because you know, you, 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 cannot make, you cannot afford to make any mistakes, you know. Um, so here, uh, again, we look at the, the records of the student, whether he's, uh, you know, high flyers or, you know, uh, has received any awards during the master's or during the undergraduate. You know, for example, Bright Spark is always our, our benchmark at one point to, to, to move people forward, you know, to, for, for Slap Slide even, you know, I think uh, UM has started that uh, Bright Spark some years ago and we have also used that platform. Uh, to select our candidate. Uh, so, and then the academic background and, you know, and at the end you have, you still have to pass the IELTS and, uh, and stuff for the requirements. So students must be good in, uh, in English, you know. Uh, okay, you know, see selection, I think I've touched that uh, a bit uh, uh, a while ago. So I just keep, I mean, I just can say own experience. I think Dr. Inley has mentioned about own ex her own experience, how she has worked with the New South Wales universities and she has partnered with the with uh, i mean she has broadened her horizon and worked with other universities so this is own experience you know so we, we also use that 
uh, like for example, when we go for basis, uh, basis is the British Association of Sport and Exercise Science uh, Conference, and sometimes we know who has been presenting most studies and most papers, and we know that Labra and Liverpool John Moore has always been topped, you know, uh, in, in, in this uh, aspect. So, okay, that's own experience and U UK RAE ranking, and of course the QS ranking. So subject experts, again, it's the same thing. So diversity, uh, cutting edge and multidisciplinary research. So that's our focus, you know, how we want to, 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 to get our, our candidate in into such program so that when they come back, they can easily fill in, you know, can work with people from engineering or free, from people from different faculties and they can come up with, you know, uh, new ideas and, and venture into new territories, you know. Um, research facilities, you know, they were quite skeptic in the beginning that UN doesn't have the uh, right facilities, uh, but we took some photos and, of course, uh, I, I will come to the track record in a while, but this ties with the track record. Uh, you know, uh, being a, a classical university in the UK, they always try to, 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 to see whether you have enough, um, you know, uh, equipments or, you know, research uh, devices. Um, and they want to see your publication, what papers have you published and where you have published these studies, you know, for us, for them to know that you have the devices, you know, so it, it is, um, you just have to bear this, you know, you just have to swallow this and just, okay, just send whatever they want, you know, of course, they can just Google and I will pop, use using PubMed uh, to get these information, but it's good for you just to send what you have done and stuff. If you're just starting a, a um, your early part of your discussion. So communication, you must give timely feedback because in the UK, the, we, we, you know, they have, uh, all, of course, the, the time difference and as well as they want to know what whatever the, the decision and they want it to be fast, you know. Otherwise, they will send you a reminder in, in two, three days, like, can you respond or something like that, okay. So, okay, back to the track record here. Um, so the, the, this track record, it works both ways in a way. So supervising PhD students through to completion, this is also one of the criteria, although it's not written anywhere in the document, but this is what the student, uh, the, any supervisor should bear in mind to work with the UK university. So you must have got good record of supervising PhD students through completion. So they want to see how many people have completed under your supervision. So it is important, although, although it's not written, although it's not compulsory, you may have a good uh, publication uh, track record. So I think that may, uh, may, may cover some of this uh, uh, um, uh, part if you are just starting your new, new uh, staff member. So don't be too worried, but I'm just saying what I felt, you know, but this is my experience. Um, okay, strong publication record, active in the field of research, so they always look uh, like in the past five years, you know, what's up, what uh, have you published and what have you, what areas, you know, because they want to match with their areas, you know, you can't say you be, you're sending students to an area where you don't your research yourself, you know, so you must have some evidence that you have been researching in these areas. And then have sufficient time to provide adequate supervision. So this is why I, I did not choose uh, a high, uh, high rank professors, because I know they are busy. Uh, they may not have enough time. So I chose somebody who is, uh, you know, a budding uh, or uh, who is just, uh, you know, uh, maybe joined the university in the last five years and then producing a lot of, uh, a lot of new papers, you know, uh, uh, good papers. So I use that as the criteria to, uh, to choose the uh, supervisors. I think it works both ways here. Okay, uh, so what are the advantages, right? I think uh, here is a research experience for both, for not just uh, for the student, it's for the, for the supervisors as well on the diversity, cutting edge, multidisciplinary research that you can also do a, uh, some academic visits uh, like with the University of Sydney, uh, it is stipulated in the MO, MOA that there'll be visits from both universities. So they come here and we go there and then we, we, we spend some time and we do the seminars and uh, we follow through some of the research work the students are doing, were doing. Uh, and here networking is also important uh, and then it, it is also a benefit for uh, all. Uh, you can meet people, you have your external examiners and you make the UK always have quite a lot of collaborators. So sometimes in, the, in a publication, you find five, six names you don't know, but you, you, you are looked in in, in in the emails and you kind of introduce yourself and then you maybe email them privately for other things and, you know, for information and whatnot. So this networking is very, very, uh, you know, it's very fruitful, you know. Um, 
And then the last plea is costing because with Australian University, we, we, uh, we had uh, home, uh, home fees. So that means our, our student, our candidate paid, uh, paid their fees as their home student, like Australian, not like international student. Uh, but in the UK, it was a discounted, uh, discounted rate. Instead of paying for three years, you pay for, I think, uh, for 18 months. Uh, but then you stayed for 24 months. Uh, sorry, 20, uh, yeah, 24 months, actually. Yeah. Um, so there's some discount there with uh, the, with, with, uh, so whatever, I mean, whichever way, uh, costing wise, it is uh, cost effective, right? in my opinion. And, um, and lastly, right, the impact here. So just to sum up uh, what I have, uh, I have discussed or shared my experience, in fact, human resource development, uh, joint publication or IP, so research grant. And with the UK, you have the Newton Research Grant. You can apply that together with the, with the collaborators from the UK. Um, or networking, I mentioned that, costing and academic visit. So those are the impact that, you know, that you can, you can count this, you know, it's objectively measured, can be objectively measured. Uh, um, beyond the duration. So this is important because the candidate and the supervisors from both institutions act as a conduit you know, for collaborative projects that will go beyond the duration of the program. And I think that was also mentioned uh, by Dr. Inley about the, you know, the, uh, how her student has ventured into uh, uh, other research groups and stuff. So those are important. So for, for us at CSCS, uh, um, from, from, the, from this uh, dual PhD program, we have appointed a program assessor, our, our uh, undergraduate program assessor, or even our uh, PhD program assessor uh, in the past, uh, from this uh, dual PhD uh, program. So we, we, we ventured into that and has become external examiners to our PhD candidate. Co-supervision. Uh, so this is uh, this is in the pipeline. We are now starting to discuss a, a potential project with co-supervision from uh, Lapura, for example. And of course, whenever you do seminar, uh, and you know they can, they will be more than happy to uh, to assist you because you already established the connection and and you have shown that you are you know you are you know you 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 have the uh, the material you know the the essence you know of the uh, research areas that you ventured into. And okay, lastly, like, I would like to thank, special thank to uh, Prof. Uh, Camila, uh, especially uh, for helping all the documentation, and, you know, uh, without her assistant, I think I myself would have given up, you know, uh, because it's, it's quite tedious. Uh, and as well as the uh, ex-dean of IGS, Prof. Datin Dr. Nohanam, and I think she's, uh, you know, she's always been there and then she's, uh, you know, she really acknowledged all the help she has uh, rendered, you know, she had rendered us, you know. Uh, I think with that, uh, Prof. Young, I, I, I end my sharing session. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashri. A lot of things to take in, you guys, all the pointers, they're very useful. I'm sure the... Uh, the organizer will share some of uh, the slides here yeah, for, for you guys to digest and internalize and see what are the what are the key points that he has raised. But I can see a lot of questions coming in. So um, once again, thank you very much, Dr. Ashrin. Uh, I just want to sum up looking at the, um, the experience in um, supervising this uh, dual PhD program. You started out very early I'm sure if I go back the timeline, you were just a, a very young lecturer then, and then reaching out to universities that you're not an alumni to start with. So you have actually pointed out that it's really how you sell yourself. How do you prove to the other partner, hey, this is, this is a good a project. He or she has credible as a co-supervisor. I think you have actually proven to all the universities that you are not an alma mater to start with, isn't it? <laughs> Dr. Asri, congratulations again. So I hope Thank the you. numbers are keep, keep coming in and perhaps mentor the um, new uh, supervisors who are keen to embark into this. Yeah? Two key things that I would like to summarize. You were looking at universities on the RAE ranking for universities in UK. That means it translates to the facilities that the university would have being highly ranked. So that actually will be very beneficial. Second key point I think very important is look for co-supervisors whom 
or just the young lecturers like you, the same like-minded, budding with scientists, really passionate, who have got the time to supervise students. I think these are some of the things that you have shared, but I'm sure others also would have picked up. Okay, I'm just going to read the questions now. Uh, Dr. Ilini, did you, these are all the four graduate, uh, four graduate students uh, collaborated at UNSW re received dual PhD scrolls then? Uh, is it due to the agreement? Well, all these things, all this nitty gritty, leave it at the central level to sort it out. So all we need to do on your side is to make sure that the students, your co-supervisors over there are all working together harmoniously and we will provide the support at the background and, and do all these things, the nitty gritty, where is the scroll, what is, what is the logo and da, da, da and so forth. So just bring it to our attention at the central level, AASC will assist on this one. Next question, is the below case called a dual program, international joint program? Let me know beyond. Uh, below cases. PhD student re registered at the other national, international university, but taken UM faculty as co supervisor. Right. Now, of course, uh, for us as academics, we always have collaborators abroad. A lot of the time when we collaborate, we kind of invite. Or let's say a university from other uh, from other country to sort of co-supervise per se. So a lot of the time, most of us will uh, will get the uh, students to fill in the form, and uh, the faculty will kind of you know uh, send the invitation letter with an appointment saying you you are a co-supervisor of this student, uh, blah blah blah, and so forth. But that does not entail the dual PhD. It is just a co a co the supervision under the UM umbrella. The only visible thing that you can see is in the publication. But this one takes to the next level where the degree awarded will be very beneficial for the students. As what Elinie has mentioned, you will get two scrolls. There's a lot of paperwork as what has been described by Dr. Asri and Elini, but at the central level, we will try to provide the support as much as we would like to. So this is bringing to the next level when students, when they go out there, you really have two different PhDs. How the others interpret is something that uh, I shall not comment. Right. So I open to the floor for any questions. Perhaps Dr. Asher, anything that you feel that, you know, it's, it's worth uh, bringing up that you might have missed in, in your presentation. Would you like to uh, uh, yeah, I, I think the publication uh, the publication requirement for UM has to be uh, has to be spelled out from the beginning uh, to the partner in UC because I think um, in the UK they don't have this requirement. Um, so we uh, we explain to, to 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 the partners and they 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 they, they thought it, it is it is uh, you know after you have submitted the thesis then you write a paper. Uh, but we say that in order to graduate, you need to have uh, uh, two publications, and and you know I, I think that needs to, to be discussed because they may think that it is uh, it is uh, something that they don't practice and they don't want to uh, follow. And as a matter of fact, they did not want it to be uh, to be within the uh, the the, the write up <laughs> of the MOA. They don't want it to be in the write up. They say that okay, we can take this and we. Uh, it's just between us and we agree to get the publication sorted before, for, before graduation, uh, but we they don't want it to be in the document because they think that it, 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 they do not want it to be a precedent, I suppose, yeah, Prof. Young. I think that's one thing that's important to, to, to highlight. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's the challenges. But uh, rest assured, the IRO is always there to assist you by all means just reach out to us and see how we can assist you in making the experience you as a co-supervisor as well as students a very fruitful journey uh dr Inini, any last um important tips that you would like to share mm, not really but i think the the most important thing like what dr ashri said just now is to is to make sure that the students really graduate um not so much about graduating within three years, um, but the quality has to be there um, because that would ensure that that would ensure the sustainability of the program. Because when you start, people trust in you uh, that they are they're okay to even waive tuition fee like UNSW. So the stress there is that 
I have to make sure that the students would graduate all of them. Um, otherwise, it would carry a, a bad name for you. Um, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you once again on behalf of the ADAC. Thank you very much, Dr. Asriel. Thank you, Evin Lee. I hope these sharing sessions will get more people excited. Wait till the end of the sessions, we will share with you how do we move forward, what kind of support that we give at the central level. So once again, uh, thank you very much, Shata Asriel. Thank you, Ilin Lee. I hand thank over you to Dr. Noraza. Thank you, Prof. Young, for moderating the session. We are very honoured to listen from Prof. Ilin Lee and uh, Dr. Asriel. Yeah? Um, I'm sure a lot of us are very excited and we understand the, the, the effort that goes into it. Yeah, a lot of us perhaps I can I can I can sense that we perhaps uh, want things to be laid out in front of us and know what are the challenges before we start on that journey. So in this case, um, we have to have a little bit of different mindset where you have to be a little bit more and adventurous and uh, take it as it comes, you know, be open-minded, be positive and, and take everything as a challenge and have the goal at the end as your, 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 your key um, success rather than, you know, having, uh, making sure that everything is um, arranged for you before you start taking the first step. I think that's the, that's the, um, the main key message that I got from listening from uh, both uh, the panels and also Prof. Young's um, summary um, so now we formally end the second session and we will start our session number three in less than five minutes it's already 11 57 on my my computer so we have a three minutes break if you would like to have a cup of coffee or um, you know, take a, a, a little stretch so i'll see you around back in uh, three minutes at 12 p.m sharp see you soon uh, sorry, uh, may, may I ask, uh, coordinator? Uh, oh, yes, uh, this yes. Is, uh, sorry, this is Dr. Uh, yes. uh, the recording will be uh, shared, kah? Can, can, can we have, yeah, because I have another meeting at uh, I can't. Sure, it's sure. It's been a very excellent meeting. Okay, okay. all right, thank you. I have all to go. webinars from ADAC will be published on our ADAC YouTube okay, channel. Okay, all right, thank you. So, I, I have another meeting, thank you, sorry. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, so um, you can, you can, uh, we will not be sending the slides to all of the participants, but we will publish the whole webinar on our ADAC YouTube channel. So uh, look out for that. Once um, everything is ready, we will upload it and just, just feel free to check up on it anytime. Yeah, so we have a two minutes break. I'll see you soon at 12. Okay, just a little reminder before we start the third session. Um, we will put up our attendance form and feedback form on the chat section on the side. Yeah, this side, this side. And uh, please don't forget to fill up the attendance form and also the feedback form for us to issue the certificates to you. Yeah. So if uh, Dr. Mio is ready, I would like to introduce, the, uh, to, to formally open the third session and introduce Dr. Mio. Okay, Associate Professor Dr. Mio Hakif is currently the Head of Department of Geology, University of Malaya. University of Malaya. He graduated in 2011 with a PhD from Imperial College, University of London in sedimentology. His field of expertise is sedimentary geology and stratigraphy. Dr. Mio has more than 10 years experience in research collaboration and consulting in the petroleum industry but he's, he has mainly focused on the characterization of tidal sand bodies, which are an important and challenging hydrocarbon bearing reservoir type in Southeast Asia. Previously, he, has also, uh, he was also the coordinator of the Master of Petroleum Geoscience program at UM for five years. So we're very honored to have uh, Associate Professor Dr. Mio Hakif with us right now. Yes, okay. So without further ado, we will um, um, pass the screen to you, Dr. Mio. Oh, okay, uh, th thank you, uh, Dr. Nazah. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Uh, it's already noon, yeah? Uh, the, it's a uh, good, I think we say good afternoon. Yeah? Uh, first, let me share my screen.
So, um, uh, can everybody hear me clearly? Yes, and we can okay. see the screen too. Yes, perfect. okay. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you to uh, EDEC and IRO for, for inviting me to, to give this uh, uh, a little bit of uh, sh sharing of my experience uh, supervising uh, a PhD student doing a dual degree program in, in Australia. Uh, I think I am at a, a little bit of a disadvantage here because you have two very good speakers uh, uh, before me, uh, Dr. Ashley and Dr. Dr. Anley, who, who, who uh, mentioned already the main challenges and the, the main advantages that, that you get from, from a dual degree program and also the major challenges in supervising the, the, these kinds of pro, uh, programs. But I'll, I'll try to add in a few things of, of my experiences which might, which might be a little bit different. Okay, so first and foremost, uh, I'm, I'm from the Department of Geology. Okay, so I'm a geologist by, by training. Okay. And my, uh, I, uh, in, in my case, um, I was supervising a PhD student uh, doing a dual degree program between UM and also ANU, Australia National University, uh, under the School of Physics. Uh, the title of the project is here. It's improved characterization of tin bed and low resistivity, low contrast hydrocarbon reservoir. So it's basically it's petroleum geology. And we have these rocks which contain uh, petroleum and it's very hard to get it out. Okay. And we try to find methods to try to get it out. And so uh, what we do here is to combine techniques from traditional geology with uh, micro CT. Uh, microcomputer tomography and uh, we try to model uh, how fluids flow to, through uh, a, a network of pores inside a very porous and permeable rock okay uh, this project is very multidisciplinary okay it involves uh, physicists from from um and also from uh, also from anu it involves mathematicians uh, the phd student was uh, and, and was an engineering graduate and I am a geologist. So I think the, the, the main challenge was in trying to integrate everybody, try to communicate with all these people with different backgrounds, with different interests, and come up with a, you know, come up with some really nice, nice results and some impacts. Okay. So yeah, uh, the great student was uh, is Dr. Hijaz Kamahasnan. So now he's a senior lecturer at the Department of Geology. Happy to see that he, he has started teaching and doing uh, active research, continuing with what he has done uh, during his uh, PhD project. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that's good. Okay, so um, I think th these are what I'm going to talk about here. As I have these three points here to help me. Um, first, uh, Dr. Enli and also Dr. Asher has already talked about this a lot. Uh, I'll just try to add a few things here, the benefits and impacts uh, to, to the students. Uh, I'll share my experience in trying to get funding and support and also the obstacles uh, faced um, during uh, the, the PhD program. Okay, so this PhD program, uh, uh, he just graduated in 2020, so is his PhD in 2020, um, and he started in, I, if I remember, it's around 2017. Okay. So I'll just go through the, uh, what I think are the main benefits and impacts uh, to, to the students. Uh, uh, Dr. Enli, Dr. Asher also mentioned, I think the, the main thing is they get lots of exposure. You get the best of both worlds, right? Uh, he just uh, spent uh, a lot of time in, on, on the UN campus uh, learning geology. Uh, that's one part that he, they did. Uh, bear in mind, he's a, he's a petroleum engineer and we had to... Get, let him catch up with all the fundamentals of how to describe sedimentary rocks. Uh, that was a major in, uh, effort, uh, in my opinion. Right. So these are two very different fields and two different ways of viewing the world and two different ways of doing uh, things. Yeah. So uh, he got exposure at UM doing geology, then went to ANU for one and a half years doing another thing, learning how to use a micro CT, uh, how to do poor network modeling. Uh, a lot of these things are even, is, is beyond my expertise. And he has uh, supervisors uh, on, on their side, well, Professor Adrian Shepard, uh, Tim Sandon, uh, Stephen Buckman also helped uh, on, on that part. 
Okay, so you get uh, those two experiences in two different fields. Uh, you're going to get two different work cultures. Uh, geologist is very traditional. We look at hard samples, looking looking at rocks. Um, our ways are maybe a little bit akin to, 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 to an engineer. Uh, and then go, going to things like numerical modeling and, the, and looking at 3D models and using X-rays and so on. Okay. Um, another thing is the student, because of the exposure, uh, the student is able to develop communication skills. Okay. Um, at least in my experience, uh, communicating and collaborating with people, especially from uh, especially uh, uh, lecturers from other universities from different uh, from other countries, uh, sometimes there's going to be a difference in culture. Uh, there's going to be lots of things which are lost in, in translation. And this has to be learned through experience. And uh, I, I think that that is uh, one of the advantages of doing a dual degree program. The, uh, the student has to go to university in another country, right? Uh, but also has the experience doing it in Malaysia yeah? and brings with him or her uh, the experience in doing research there and how to talk to people and how to work together and how to do collaborations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the next thing that leads to the next point here uh, you get an increased uh, international professional network doing all these kinds of things. Okay, so for the audience's information, um, this program, uh, this research program, which was under UMRP, UM Research uh, uh, Grant, uh, involved uh, three different parties. We had the geologists at the Department of Geology in the Simlaya, several lecturers here, several professors also. Um, we also had uh, researchers at ANU, so the National University, and also we had a stakeholder. And in this case, it is Petronas who holds the data, confidential data of national interest. So you have these three different, uh, three different institutions, and you are getting to know people from the three different institutions, and we share uh, the same interest on trying to how to try to solve a certain problem in this case. And we try to work together and like that. So yeah, you have. Uh, 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 I'm very happy. The student is very happy that we get lots of contacts from this, and we have lots of opportunities for further research. Now we're talking about other grants. We're talking about papers. We're talking about uh, consultations and, and so on. Okay. And of course, uh, a dual degree, a dual PhD. Uh, he just has a PhD from ANU and also from UM. Uh, this uh, gives a competitive advantage to, to, to the student, right? You have, uh, like I said, you have a more interdisciplinary skill set. Uh, in this case, uh, you have geology and also engineering. Uh, you, are, uh, you get um, experience in adapting better to changing working environments and fields. Uh, so you become truly multidisciplinary. Uh, so it's not just focused on just, uh, you know, working in silo on just a uh, a, a single topic, which is just an interest to you, but something uh, of a problem which is uh, which is applied in nature. We try to solve in this case extracting petroleum. So you need to work together with uh, people from other fields. Okay, so uh, you have the experience, you have those skills that you learn. Uh, for example, here uh, he just sorry uh, he just here uh, had the experience to work on the micro city, uh, uh, several micro cities, different types at ANU. And also, we have a micro city at, at UM and brought the experience uh, to UM. And now he is going to, he is the expert on, on using this machine here. And, you, and now is uh, getting uh, lots of interest from people in things like dentistry, from faculty of science, of course, from, from engineering, and lots, lots of other uh, faculties in, in UM and also in other universities. I'm happy to see that that is happening. Okay, so he just uh, got exposure to different technologies. And uh, yeah, all these are very, uh, yeah, all of these are great for employability. Uh, if, if you're not coming here to, to teach, well, yeah, he just is here to, to teach. Uh, but yeah, for, for those of you who are interested in doing these kinds of doing programs, yes, it gives you a very big advantage. Yeah, so uh, we do lots of work, lots of uh, consulting work, advisory work for petroleum companies. And uh, the trend now is for these kinds of things. Um, it's not just the traditional geologists here and the petroleum engineer there, but someone who knows um, both. And that's going to be a very big advantage. Yeah, that, that's like what I can see here. 
Okay, so here I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience in funding and support. Um, I, I need to uh, disclose here uh, early on, uh, I wasn't in the project at the start. Okay, uh, there was, uh, uh, I became the, the principal investigator later on, and yeah, we, we had uh, someone else leading the, the project, was uh, Dr. Ralph Kugler. But uh, who ended his contract with UM um, and could not continue with the project. And also Prof. Wan Hasya was very supportive of the project. So these two people were the key, key main persons in coming up with this project and coming up with trying to get the funds and also the equipment for, for, for both of these. So I'm, I'm just really continuing uh, what, what they did. Now, yeah? So uh, for Hijaz, in, in, in terms of student support, uh, he had the scholarship. So slap sly in this case, and uh, just like the, the previous speakers. Okay, so he is going. He is trained uh, to teach. Going going back to to EM. Okay, and he is now here. But we also had support in terms of a research grant. This is was a this was an uh, UMRT grant. Uh, our pro our program was a sub program, which is uh, the amount was around one hundred fifty k. But this was a sub program in a larger program, which involved. Uh, three sub-programs, uh, two from engineering. Uh, so yeah, it was a very big team trying to solve the same, the same kind of problem. And it's very interesting, especially for me, I was a very, uh, I was uh, in the early phase of my career during that time when it all started. And all of this uh, had to be learned. And, and, uh, and we had lots of experience there. And we gained a lot also in terms of career from, from this. So this is, uh, yeah. Just something I, I would like to point uh, to, to the supervisors again. So it's uh, based on experience, it's, it's, it's very challenging to do these kinds of things. But at the end, uh, it, it gives you an advantage. Uh, publications are coming out. Uh, students are interested in to, 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 to do work in, in your lab. And we have lots of consultation uh, from, uh, yeah, from, from this kind of work. Okay. So yeah, uh, this is the, the title of the, the whole program, Integrated Reservoir Characterization. So just describing rocks in different ways, digitally, during the, using the micro CT, and also using uh, traditional methods. And I've already mentioned, so this was multidisciplinary, geology, engineering, physics, and mathematics. Uh, yeah, to do this, uh, the, to do this research, uh, we needed uh, advanced uh, equipment. We needed a uh, micro tomography, we need micro CT, where we scan our rocks uh, using an X-ray and we get a 3D image. We can make slices and we can model the 3D pore networks in inside our rock samples. Okay, so a micro CT was bought and this was bought from a special allocation uh, approved by the former vice chancellor. I, I believe it is uh, Dato Gao Jasmon to set up a Reservoir Characterization and Modeling Laboratory. And the micro city is here, it is working well. Uh, we were doing work on that. And of course, uh, IO, IRO and also the Frontier Science Cluster uh, provided strong support of the research and dual degree program. Um, um, you know, just trying to link with, with, with people at ANU, uh, starting discussions, we meet people like uh, uh, Professor Siti Vinayaka, Prof Kuru, uh, who, who helped a lot because we had the context in the main context uh, for, for doing this kind of work. Okay, uh, oh, another thing I should mention, uh, how do we, uh, yeah, uh, how do we get the context? Um, it's, well, it's, it's not a straightforward kind of thing. Uh, it takes time to just first try to do some networking, get to know people. Um, uh, during the first phase of this project, there's what, lots of talking with people, staff in Petronas, for one thing. Uh, what kinds of problems would be interesting for them uh, that we, they would like um, universities to work on? And we, have, uh, we had um, uh, key technical persons in Petronas you know, who helped us try to steer uh, in what kinds of projects we, we, we could do and helped us with the proposal, what kinds of equipment we needed, what kinds of expertise we needed. And so, yeah, and, and I would like to say that Petronas was very helpful in, in, in that case. And also we needed data from them. And that is going to be, that is also one of the main, that is also one of the main obstacles we face was in terms of data. Okay, so 
Um, the previous speakers have already talked talk about, about uh, obstacles. We also face the, the same kinds of obstacles. Things like, uh, yeah, uh, two different institutions. In, in our case, three different institutions with three different bureaucracies. Uh, we needed to navigate between these. Uh, yeah, interaction between several different institutions with their own rules, uh, like the previous speakers already said, Dr. Ashley and Dr. Dendi already mentioned, uh, diff different requirements for graduation. Uh, he just had to submit uh, two PhDs, uh, two, two, uh, two theses in different formats, one for UANU, one for UM. Uh, the examination was different with a different number of supervisors right, and different rules. Um, yeah, and also another problem that we faced was in data acquisition. Uh, that, 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 uh, I, I think, um, okay, data, it, it was, we didn't know how to get data and the, the, the procedure was very opaque. I, I think uh, we had to learn new things, how to do things. We had to do a lot of talking, we had to do a lot, do a lot of discussing with people, how to do different things, how uh, we had need to ask people what is the procedure, and all of these are not very clear. And yeah, uh, that was a very, a very big challenge. But once we got things working out, we now have a nice uh, procedure of getting data acquisition from Petronas. Uh, uh, that is doing very smoothly. We, we get things like uh, two to three re data requests uh, to Petronas every year for PhD students and also MSc students. Uh, so far, we have not ha had any problems because we know how to do it. So yeah, doing, uh, I think it goes back to the main points also mentioned by the previous uh, speakers. Um, a lot of it, we need to learn. We're going to need to learn a lot of new things to read these kinds of things. Uh, There's going to be lots of obstacles. It can be stressful sometimes. Yeah. But yeah, in the end, yeah, it's... It, if, yeah, if, if the student perseveres, if the supervisor helps helps the student very well, uh, yeah, it, it will work out eventually. You get rewards that. You know, good publications. We even got a, a nature publication get, get, get do, doing uh, this kind of work here. So happy to see that. Okay. Um, what else can I say here? Um, I say, yeah, um, our obstacles, I think the, the, you know, the filling in forms, the bureaucracy part wasn't really that big of a challenge. It is a hassle, right? It takes time, yeah, but it's, it's not really the main problem in, in, in my opinion. Also, the technical part was also not really that, that big of a deal. The student was highly motivated and highly talented and could juggle two different fields in, in, in this case. And he, he was very eager to learn new things. And that, that's one thing. Need to be positive, need to be open-minded and need to, you know, be flexible in, 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 in doing things up. Oh, okay, uh, but I think the main obstacle is human in nature. Uh, yeah. uh, you can imagine we're talking about a, a very large team, two, uh, three different groups, uh, different fields, uh, basically different languages, right? Yeah. You know, geologists don't really uh, work well with numbers. Yeah. So yeah, so you, you know, we're talking with mathematicians, we're talking with physicists, we're talking with engineers. Right? It's, it's very different. It's a very different world. Yeah. <laughs> in my opinion okay so there's going to be there's bound to be conflicts okay uh, i'll be honest with you there's bound to be conflicts there's bound to be uh, misunderstandings but we try to resolve those things uh, remember just remember the target right uh, you want to graduate you want to learn new skills and you have uh, you you want to really have a good career with good publications reputation so yeah just, just remember those targets there Think in the long term, right? It's going to be about with uh, conflicts and misunderstandings. So, yeah, it is still worthwhile. Uh, both students and supervisors learn new things. Uh, new opportunities will open. Yeah? Uh, no, uh, talking talk about, uh, at least in my experience, uh, for the supervisor, right? Uh, starting out, okay, I never imagined I'll be talking about, uh, talking about uh, uh, doing computational flow models, uh, heat flow to, uh, through metal meshes, uh, tidal modeling, and so on. And these were beyond me when we started during uh, when I started my, my my teaching in 2011. But yeah, lots of uh, things to learn when you are when working with uh, a large group with uh, uh, yeah with different expertise. No, okay, yeah, what this will will open. So I th I think that is what I can say. 
Um, again, uh, thank you. I would like to thank uh, people from uh, UM Research, uh, people from IRO, and also from uh, EDEC uh, for, for, for their support. Thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Naza. Okay, thank you so much. <clears throat> Dr. Mio, Kajaya, I'm trying to. Okay, I think we have um, a good overview of how multidisciplinary this whole thing can be. How uh, you learn something that you didn't expect to learn, yeah, Prof. Mio. Uh, yes, ma'am. And um, the, the 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 adventure, like I mentioned, the adventure that comes with it from our side as supervisors as well as the student side. Mm, perhaps this is a good time for us to take questions. If there's any questions from the floor, maybe I can start with a common perception question that I can sense from the Q&As that we are getting, <clears throat> especially from the students or the future candidates of the PhD uh, join a dual. A dual PhD or a joint PhD program is separate than the scholarship or the finances. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, maybe yes, from, that's right. Maybe that's right. can also interject if, if you feel suitable, yeah? So, when we talk about this webinar, this webinar is introducing the joint PhD, but not necessarily the funding that comes with it. This is not a webinar about funding. This is a webinar about the, 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 the working collaboration that leads to a joint or a dual PhD. So um, I'm, I'm getting a sense from the, from the question and answer um, that uh, where does the money come from? Does this come with money? You know, how does the scholarship go? So that, I guess, is a separate question. And um, Dr. Inli has raised uh, the, 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 the issue about scholarship in terms of grants, in terms of negotiating the fees between the two universities and all the other nitty-gritties. Dr. Mio, would you like to ex um, add on to that, that point about the scholarship versus the program, the joint dual pro PhD program itself? Oh, okay. So yeah, I, I think thank you, Dr. So I think yeah, uh, like you said, these are two different things, right? Uh, so yeah, this should be made clear here. Uh, so I, I uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong, right? Uh, so if from my understanding, uh, yeah, uh, you um, is doing a, this dual degree kind of program. It's just like doing an, uh, an uh, yes, yeah, like a single PhD program, uh, the traditional PhD program. Uh, you will get an offer. And then uh, you, uh, you need to pay the fees. You need to choose a supervisor and so on. Uh, but yeah, also you, uh, another separate issue is a separate issue. You need to find funding for that work. Oh, okay. Uh, how to, okay, for students, how to approach this? Well, first, the, uh, the, the best way to do it is to talk to potential supervisors, right? Okay, so it's, it's um, it's not just uh, selecting the university, you know, but you need to actually try to find a supervisor that you are willing to work with. Uh, contact them through email, ke, make an appointment to meet them and talk to them. See how the person is. Now, do, do you, is there chemistry between you? Can, can you work together, do you think? Can? You get a feeling of that when, when you meet them personally. Can? And you know, coming up with these kinds of projects, sometimes it's, it's going to take a lot of uh, discussing, right? Uh, the supervisor will ask you, what are your interests? Does it jive with our interests? Right. And then you can ask things like, uh, do you have any funding from, from, from the supervisor, right? From the lecturer, right? So, yeah, you have to meet them, uh, have to discuss with them, right? Maybe if you are lucky during that time, oh, I have an opening for a research assistant in, in my grant. Yeah. Or maybe I have this very big uh, research program, I, can ha I have money to support a few students. Or maybe at least I have another contact in my department and he or she has funding to support a project. So that, that is the, the, the way to get to, to, to approach about funding. But yeah, uh, it is going to be, it's not going to be straightforward. Oh, we have money like that. You need to talk to people. You need to be open uh, to different opportunities. It's not going to, uh, sometimes the project you envision during the start, it's not going to be the same as what's going to be planned later on. Yeah? yeah, because it's discussion, you need to be very flexible um, uh, when trying to get funding. Uh, of course, uh, also, uh, sometimes it, it takes some time. You, you, you talk to the lecturer, I don't have any funding, but at least you started discussing. 
and you uh, with, and then the lecturer can try to find funds, right? Okay, so that's another way. So in our experience, that, uh, that that's my experience, uh, uh, Doctor. Thank you so much for that sharing. Um, is if if Prof Yong is still around, I would like to invite Prof Yong to add on a little bit more. But in the meantime, let's go through um, uh, the questions that we have on the chat section, yeah? Mm, okay, I'm seeing one from Leela. Leela, in terms of studentship, is this opportunity available for our international students, especially those who are self-funded? So perhaps I can request that uh, all our panels who are from the beginning of today, the session today, the webinar, who are still available. Um, maybe you would like to switch on your camera so we can answer this together, not just Dr. <laughs> Dr. Mio and myself. Some of the questions are common questions for all of us. Uh, if, if Dr. Inli is still around, Prof. Sheena, uh, Prof. Rosita, whoever is still around, um, we can take this question together, Prof. Yong. Yeah, especially those who are self-funded. So as we mentioned, scholarship is one thing that may have other um, focus in or some other approach that you may have to think about. Yeah, um, I remember Dr. Inli mentioned about her using the HIR grant and the uh, research grant that she has in order to support those. And maybe Prof. Rosita or the, the ASP office. Yeah, so, but we did mention earlier during the session number one that a student can join in the middle of the candidature, provided that the MOU and the agreement can be done very quickly so that it doesn't, um, yeah, I mean, uh, so that you can make use of that agreement, then you can graduate with that. So, I, I guess if you are interested, to um, explore this, you can uh, provide your expression of interest to the link that we have shared on top. Yeah. Um, and uh, from Mutari Lawal, thank you for sharing your experience. Please, will be will the students be getting two certificates from the two schools? Yes, yes, yes. We have mentioned this in session number two. <clears throat> Perhaps you just join in. Um, yes, the student will be getting two certificates from two PhD when we say dual or join PhD. All right. If there's any, um, I welcome anyone to ask question verbally. If there's any. Okay. So I have a question. Yes, please. Who is that? So uh, I'm actually Dr. Punya from Department Physics. So here I, I have some theory connecting to, for example, a student's uh, joint PhD program under supervision from different university outside Malaysia. But in case, if he want to uh, pursue the uh, dual PhD program, can uh, register here for a dual PhD program uh, in connection to that university? Okay, I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer this. Prof, uh, is Prof Yong or anyone from the AVC available or from IRO to advise? Is this your question? Is in case one student join in the PhD program outside of Malaysia? Is that your question? The one that you type. Is the student able to join the dual pre program with UM, is that, is that the question? Okay, we don't have um, someone to be able to answer it right now, but um, can I request that you write to us or the IRO or um, ASP in order to, yes, SPC for the questions. On the chat section, if you have detailed questions, yeah, you can uh, write to either Academic Strategic Planning Center at the chat section. The email is there, aspc at um.edu.my. 
the IRO office, International Relations Office, international at um.edu.my, and also um, ADEC as the organizer. We might not be the best people to answer the questions, but we can help direct you to the right people. Yeah. So um, we do have a special announcement here. Fresh from the oven, uh, Prof. Yong requests that uh, I make this announcement that we will have a second part of this webinar. Yeah, the second part of this webinar, looking at the responses that we are getting, we started with 88, if I'm not mistaken, 88 participants. And after three hours, we are still at number 71 participants. So that, that's, a good, that's a good sign that this is a hot topic and people are willing to explore more about this dual slash join PhD programs. There's a lot of interest there, Alhamdulillah. And uh, I am very happy that Prof. Yong has agreed for us to organize a second part later. Later, we'll announce a time. Um, somewhere along the line with partnering with University in Europe, France. Maybe we have a lots, lots of connections there. Academic management of dual candidate. Uh, we will have the AASC and the Timbalandekan uh, Isal Tinggi together in that session. And also uh, support for dual supervisor um, taken by uh, maybe Prof. Yong's office and also IRO. Yeah. So um, with that, with those two announcements, I hope we are all looking forward to the next stage or next um, uh, how to part of, of it. This is like a like a perkenalan, like a, an exposure to dual PhD program that we didn't know that some of us are already do already doing this really, really greatly. So we want this to be a culture in um, among us all. And uh, for those who are interested to to take it up, let's 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 do this. Yeah. Um, before we end the session, I would like to uh, get a reminder for those of you who has not who has not uh, filled up your attendance form, it's on the chat section and also the feedback form. Uh, uh, please fill up both. And uh, from there, we will trace you back in order for us to provide the certificate. So I guess if there's any other question, if there's no any other question, maybe we can invite everyone to switch on your cameras. And we have a group photo session. ADEX favorite is to have a group photo session. Thank you so much for everyone who has been staying from the beginning. Okay, so um, whenever we are ready, uh, I will wait for the queue from the organizers. Smile.